Thank you, Sam. There's always a, an element of trepidation when uh, you introduce, because you never know what you're just about to say. Um, can I ask you two things to start off? First of all, for that young man that spoke earlier, John White, uh, you've got a bright, bright future ahead of the young man. That was a fantastic contribution. And, um, and you're the type of people that we need to stand up, the next generation, and I'm going to talk about that in a, in a little while. And so it was, it was Sam. Osama, you needn't have worried about your English. It's probably better than mine. <laughs> uh, but, uh, but can I tell you that, um, you know, whenever I feel a bit down and about the prospects of peace in the Middle East, uh, I'll actually think back to the contribution you've made today, because you've demonstrated that despite the hardships of life that people face in Gaza, and I've visited there uh, in parliamentary visits, uh, and you can see the poverty that is inflicted upon people, not by Israel, but by Palestinian leaders who put their own um, self-interest ahead of their people, uh, then you're a future. You, in the words that you use today, demonstrate that there is a potential still for peace and we should always strive for it. So thank you very much. For Can I also say that, uh, yeah, there are Israeli and Palestinian flags that Sami stole, but can I just categorically state that there is no suggestion that Sami helped the Labour Party procure those flags uh, for the Labour Party <laughs> conference uh, in the last few weeks, apparently, that they got them all themselves. But I do want to uh, pay tribute to Sami, to Vicky, to the whole GFI team who, week in, week out, rain, sleep, hail or snow, and we do to all the elements here. Uh, you're an example of how to advocate uh, for a cause. Uh, dedicated, measured, polite and courteous, and you're a huge ad asset to Israel advocacy in the United Kingdom. And can I just say there's, there's lots of Samis all over the UK. I don't need to worry, Vicky, that, uh, <laughs> that uh, somehow Samis re reinvented themselves, or he's cloned himself, and there's lots of Sami Steins going around the country, but there are lots of people across the country, North West Friends of Israel, Sussex Friends of Israel. Uh, I was at the first night, I was at South Coast Friends of Israel in Farnham, uh, meeting people there, and of course we get people in the north of England, the middle of England, the Highlands of Scotland, Northern Ireland, Wales, you name it, we have people. And that was the reason that Israel Britain Alliance was formed, because when the people decided they no longer wanted my services in 2015, as elected member of parliament, I was asked by two individuals in particular, Josh Swidler and Jacob Lyons, what is the problem with Israel advocacy in the UK? And here was my answer. From a UK perspective, there wasn't any Israel advocacy. There was lots of groups individually who were doing wonderful work, GFI being one of them, and also the work that Judy does, but there was nobody coordinating that whole package together to have an impact at UK level. So meantime, politicians were being bombarded by messages from the boycott, divestment and sanctions movement and the Palestine Solidarity Campaign in Parliament. Uh, and I'll tell the story because he's sitting in the front, front bench here. This gentleman here, Walter Heck, who was one of my constituents in East Kilbride Street in Lesbian Hegel, got in contact with me in 2014 and said, what are you doing to support Israel during Operation Protective Edge? I said, I'll tell you what I'm doing. I'm standing up every day arguing in the House of Commons chamber to support Israel and the challenges that it faces. What are you doing? This is the first time I've heard from you. <laughs> Thankfully, Walter didn't take offence. Um, but I made the point because there was a Jewish community in the, areas that I rep in the area that I represented. I never heard from them. Meantime, I would hear on a weekly basis from people who wanted me to get into the chamber and condemn Israel, which I steadfastly refused to do. And I won't give you my Damascus road in relation to why I support Israel. Needless to say, it's because in this part of the world, the west of Scotland, many of us remember the bigotry, our own home bigotry, that we have. Uh, and so therefore I remember my father not getting jobs because of uh, what school he went to. And I remember that I didn't get a job with an organisation called Jays. Remember we used to flush the toilet? And the blue stuff would come down. <laughs> they denied me an opportunity when I was 18, and I found out it was because of the school that I went to. So therefore, we know about bigotry in this part of the world. Thankfully, every generation that passes by, uh, it dilutes and it weakens, which is a great thing. But nonetheless, it's there. But I also looked at the Jewish people, the trauma that they come through through the shore, 
and also looked at this magnificent country, surrounded by enemies that every day of its life want, they want to see it destroyed. And this little country <coughs> has given us more scientific breakthroughs, more technological breakthroughs, more medicinal breakthroughs than any other nation in world per capita than the wonderful state of Israel. So, you guys here don't need me to tell you why you love Israel. You all have your reasons. Uh, but my uh, transition when I was a young man and learning history and understanding this part of the world, uh, it's only strengthened my beliefs for every year that's passed and that's why I became a member of Trade Union Friends of Israel and then a member of Labour Friends of Israel. And I'll answer your question in a minute, uh, Sammy, about whether I'm still there or not. But what you have in your packs, how many people in the room have put up your hand if you participated in an Israel-Britain Alliance campaign? Fantastic. How many people have participated in We Believe campaigns? How many people have participated in a Christians United for Israel campaign? Okay, we'll see whether you're participating in all those sort of campaigns. It's been organised by the Israel Britain Alliance. Because what we do, we bring in everything together and saying, we're not better than, we believe isn't better than Kufai. Kufai isn't better than IBA. We aren't, and nobody's better than Kofis or Wales Friends of, Friends of Israel. I say, listen, let's get together. Because together we are stronger, we're a more cohesive unit than we are as disparate parts. So let me tell you this, ladies and gentlemen. An average of Palestinian solidarity campaign will get about 10 to 12,000 emails to MPs in every campaign. Okay? They're working out 650 parliamentary constituencies, divide that into the total number, I'll give you an idea of where we are. And they are listened to. MPs react to what they say. Our first campaign, February, March 2016, we got 1,387 emails. Not bad for a first campaign with all those damn people coming together. But let me tell you that when we ran a campaign this year to defend Israel, when the Hamas were orchestrating the, the violent riots in the borders, and one thing that I just have to say, because I have to say it every time, who takes a kid to a riot? Who takes a child to a riot? Who takes a baby to a riot? You know, my parents brought us up, five of us. You know, they protected us at every stage of our lives. My mother, who's 81 years of age, and we celebrated my son's engagement to his, uh, his, uh, his partner uh, last night in his school pride. Uh, she still tries to protect me from the bad people around there. And I had to tell her, that, I had to say to my mum that, that I still do need that protection. Uh, but but uh, there's a form in your, your little pack that you got. Uh, Vicky's asked me to remind you, it's Israel Britain Alliance, and it's got space for your name, your address, all your details. The reason we need that is because if we don't have that detail, it's worthless. Because if you're going to write to your MP, the first thing they need to know is, do you live in my constituency? So that gives them that information. And because we run an email campaign platform, put your email address is crucial as well. Uh, so it's pretty straightforward. If you can fill it in and give it back to me uh, after I've spoken today, I'd be delighted. Uh, if you're already signed up, you'll get our information anyway via email. Um, so hopefully I'm going to convince you in the next few moments to to fill in that form and hand it back to me. If for, for whatever reason you forget, then please, Vicky's uh, offer to be a contact point. Vicky and Sammy will be able to get those uh, filled in forms to me. But I'm going to do something now which I've not done for three years. And I'm going to talk to you about party politics in the UK. I am a former Labour politician. Uh, I was a Labour councillor for 11 years. I was a Labour MP for five years, from 2010 to 2015 and I was a trade union official for 26 years. And I know that the question you're all asking is, how does it look so young? <laughs> <laughs> After working in that environment. But uh, the humour aside, there's I know people across our country who support Israel and the Jewish people uh, from a range of different backgrounds, faiths and political perspectives. And I work now with both Labour Friends of Israel and <coughs> Conservative Friends of Israel. And what unites us is that we all share a heart for Israel. But today, our cause, what we believe in, faces an unprecedented and existential threat from a party that I used to call my political home, the British Labour Party. Ladies and gentlemen, I, I don't need to know, I don't want to know what your political affiliations are. I know some of you will have voted Labour, uh, and some of you will have even represented Labour as I have. And some of you will have family links, and we heard about them a few moments ago, about uh, the people who have long links with the Labour Party and, ha and, ha and how their parents would be turning in their graves 
in the current state of affairs. But I don't offer you any good news in this because the party, the Labour Party, has been completely taken over by the extreme left. And while some of you may wistfully hope that at some point in the future that that's going to change um, and it's going to turn to some sort of semblance of common sense, I'm afraid that I am too burdened by the knowledge of the internal party Labour infrastructure, the rules that have been changed, the rules that will be changed, uh, to offer you any hope that that's going to happen. As far as my experience tells me, the Labour Party as an organisation or a force for good uh, is finished. Uh, there is no short or medium term possibility of a return to less extreme politics and I fear that the long term uh, diagnosis is equally bleak. Why do I say that? Uh, because a perfect storm of, maybe they will remember this in the last couple of years, Ed Miliband's three pound membership offer, uh, his instantaneous resignation to go and hold the uh, Ibiza after the 2015 uh, general election, the decision of a budding, um, ostensibly moderate Labour MPs to nominate Jeremy Corbyn to the ballot paper. If he hadn't been nominated, he would never have been elected. And you'd have probably, I always think sometimes, but you know, the, the fork in the road. If I'd went in that direction, what would have happened? Andy Burman would have been named the Labour Party, the Labour Party leader. He would have been middle of the road. Yeah. There wouldn't have been a 2017 general election. And all things would have changed. Instead, we have the Labour Party that has been taken over. And I mean lock, stock and smoking barrels by the extreme hard left. The people that I fought against when I was a young man in the trade union movement. And ladies and gentlemen, I was a, when I was a politician and a doorstep, I often said this. When someone said, particularly if they weren't going to vote for me, I said to them, well look, in a democracy, you're entitled to vote against your own self-interest. But I don't recommend it. Now, after they had a wry smile across their face, and I have to tell you that in terms of that position, I am going to take my own advice. And uh, I judge Jeremy Corbyn not by his declarations that he's a lifetime, lifelong anti-racist, but by his deeds. Uh, Jeremy Corbyn called Hamas and Hezbollah, terrorist groups that seek to destroy the state of Israel and create genocide, his friends. He said they were serious and hard-working and dedicated partners for long-term peace and social justice. He was invited by the Israeli Labour Party to visit Yad Vashem in Israel, and he has steadfastly refused to do so. He compared Israel with the Nazis. He was part of, and then dissembled, if you want a better term, he lied about his involvement in the laying of a, a wreath to commemorate amongst those who killed 11 Israeli athletes at the 1972 Olympics, one of my earliest memories of uh, the Olympic Games. He received campaign donations from terrorist groups, and he's still to take action against Labour Party members who have been caught red-handed being anti-Semitic, but, but yet, when it came to two Labour MPs, Dame Margaret Hodge and my very good friend, Ian Austin, as soon as they challenged that self-same anti-Semitism, they were immediately being hauled through the Labour Party rulebook. I listened to Lord Sachs, who I think is a sheer Tony Blair's view of Lord Sachs in terms of his intellect and the contributions that he's made to British life. How anti-Semitism has mutated over the centuries uh, from a hatred of the religion uh, to a hatred of the race. And in 2018, ladies and gentlemen, I have to tell you that it's mutated once again uh, that 